Matthew chapter 14 is where we're going to pick it up, looking at verses 22 and 23. Let's go ahead and read this together. Ready, set, go. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Not, not, a, not a ton of uh, emotion that followed that reading. And I understand why, because, you know, this really doesn't move us. I think in 2024, in the culture we live in, in the Amazon Prime age, right, where uh, you, at, you, you, the, the, the record stores all went out of business because you can just pull the song up in an instant, right? And um, everything is very quick and noisy and loud and direct. And so when we look at a text like this, we say, what? The topic that I want to preach on this morning is this. Deepen my silence and solitude. Deepen my silence and solitude. And silence and solitude is something that we see throughout the Bible, especially through the life of Jesus, that is a spiritual discipline that oftentimes is underrated and left out of the things that we're really called to do to take us deeper in our walk with Jesus. I, I don't, in the Deepen series, I don't want to just pick random things to preach on. I want to think, ask the Lord, what are some things that we could actually do to go deeper? God, I want to get better. God, I want to actually do something that's going to take me further. I don't want to just stay in the routine. Take me deeper. And this was a topic that I felt like I've never preached on. I need to grow in my personal life. So I don't want to just grow alone. I want you to grow with me. Come on, let's go. Somebody say, let's grow. Deep in my silence, in my solitude. Let me go ahead and define those two words up on the screen. We'll use the Oxford Dictionary as a way of definition. The word silence means complete absence of sound. So it's creating a moment in your life that has no extra noise. Silence is when the music is off, the uh, white noise machine is even down, there's not a background sermon being played. There's not worship music instrumentals softly playing in the background, right? Now, these things are good things. It's not a podcast that you're listening to. It, it, it's actually the absence of any type of sound. That's what true silence is. Now, solitude is the state or situation of being alone. It's where nobody else is invited. It's not you and your best friend. It's not you and a big group of people. It's not you and your charge group. It's just you alone with no sound. The introverts are starting to like this sermon. Come on. Amen. Um, the extroverts are squirming a little bit like, why? I'm more extroverted in nature. And so I, I get charged up around people. I'm more relational. I, I like the activity and, and the buzz and the sound in the air, right? Um, and so this right here creates a bit of a tension because it requires stopping and slowing to the point where it's the absence of sound and the state of being alone. But can I say to go deeper is not just silence and solitude for the sake of silence and solitude, but for the sake of connecting that much deeper with the Lord. So even for the introverts that are thinking, ooh, I love this. I want to close the shutters. I want to snuggle up in my bed, and I just want to be silent and solitude. Can I just tell you, the, the God we're talking about will interrupt that. That, that, that the noise that starts to come about is the, the Holy Spirit's voice and the word of God on display, that the silence and solitude is not for the sake of just doing it, similar to fasting, right? Our fasting is not just dieting. The topic of fasting is so that you can disconnect from the flesh so that you can reconnect with God. Prayer and fasting go together, and silence and solitude is something that we see Jesus model in his life. Um, it's not just Jesus, by the way. We're going to look to a few texts that give us a picture of that, but can I just say this is, this is in the beginning there was silence and solitude, amen? Um, David writes this verse in Psalm 46, verse 10, that I think should always be near to our hearts. Here's what he says. He says, come on, be still 
and know that I am God. I've found that and when life starts lifing, you know, and all of a sudden you got problems and anxieties and bills and struggle and, and hardship and relationship tension, and maybe some family stuff and all types of stuff that, you know, maybe insecurities. You, know, you could take all of that into a moment of silence and solitude and just be still and know that God is God and it will give you a different perspective on everything. On everything. Just by, just by stilling and knowing, and nothing externally changed, just your posture changed. Because you were able to stop in a moment of silence and solitude and know that he will make a way. He always makes a way. Be still and know that I am God. This was, this was the posture of David's heart. If you look through the book of Psalms, you'll find a lot of his journal entries where he writes on this, like in Psalm 62, you'll find him saying, for God alone, oh my soul, wait in silence. David is telling his soul, don't get too loud. Soul, wait in silence for my hope is from him. Soul, calm down, right? Wait for him. You, you don't have to rush it. Silence and solitude creates moments for us to be still, creates moments for us to wait on the Lord, creates moments for us to call on the Lord. In fact, if you look into in the, the life of Jesus, you'll find him prioritizing uh, the, the task of silence and solitude in his own ministry. One of the most challenging verses that I've seen, and I mean it when I say that, this is coming from a pastor, a ministry leader, I like crowds. I like to be around people. I like when people show up hungry for the Lord. Come on, amen? There's nothing wrong with that, but I want you to see this moment in Jesus' life. Luke chapter 6, you'll find this on display. In Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, it says, But now even more, the report about Jesus went abroad. So what just had happened? Well, Jesus, uh, he, he took a moment to heal somebody with leprosy. And can I just tell you, leprosy, it was the worst of all diseases in that time frame. Um, between it being contagious to it being repulsive, somebody who had leprosy, if they were to walk in, their skin uh, was kind of being, being eaten up by the disease from the outside in. So the skin color would change to like a whiteness and all of a sudden sores would be popping out in different spots and, and scabs all over the body. And so the the... Uh, idea was wherever you went, you had to announce, I have leprosy, so that people would move away. And if you got too close to the person with leprosy, you would be announced as unclean. And then you had to outcast and isolate yourself. So if somebody walked in here right now and s with leprosy, right, they would get a whole section to themselves, amen, uh, because nobody wanted to be around them or be unclean. Well, what happens in the gospel is there's a man who has leprosy and everybody's freaking out, and Jesus walks right up to the man and touches his face. And the leprosy doesn't jump on Jesus, but the healing power of Jesus jumps on the man. What's the purpose of that? Is that you can bring all your mess to Jesus and he's not scared of it. You can bring all of your struggles and sin and the stuff that everybody else is repulsed by and Jesus is leaning in, right? And so Jesus heals this individual and suddenly there's a report about what just, a man who had leprosy now has like a smooth baby face. And his hands are looking strong and good. How did this happen? He says, man, it was Jesus. And so people go, well, I want some Jesus, right? They came run, run, running to him, right? And so great crowds gathered to hear him. Hmm, I want to hear him. That sounds like good ministry. When great crowds are gathering to hear preaching and to be healed of their infirmities. Now, verse 16, everybody say the word, but come on, but, but he would withdraw to desolate places to pray. Jesus would remove himself from the crowd, from the noise, from the people even. This is good stuff. There's nothing bad about this. There might just be something better than this. Jesus would take intentional time to withdraw from the places, just like he did in Matthew 14 before he walked on water, and he did it for the purpose of prayer. He would... He would check out of good ministry and plug into good intimacy with the Father for the purpose of prayer. Now, listen to me, Walk Church. I want to see everybody's eyes. Come on, lean in for a second. Camera, come on, lean in for a second. Online, lean in for a second. Look, 
If Jesus Christ modeled and lived this way, come on, tell me, how much more should we? If the Lord himself, the Son of God, the sinless Savior, made sure that he would take time to withdraw from the crowds, to prioritize desolate places for the purpose of prayer, friend, I just want to tell you, how much more should that be an alarm to us to model after our Lord? Silence and solitude was something that Jesus practiced. And hey, practice how you're going to play. Amen. Right. And Jesus models something for us that we could, could learn from. And I really think that we should learn from. And so what I want to do is I want to give you three points today. And what, really what they are is there are three areas that will be helped in your life if you commit to silence and solitude. In other words, this is going to help you. By prioritizing silence and solitude, it's going to help you in three primary areas. Let me give you the first one. Going deeper in silence and solitude is going to help you grow in spiritual disciplines. No, a, a, a delayed amen. <laughs> and I get it because, one, I don't think we do well with the word discipline. And two, I think spiritual disciplines are hard. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's difficult at times to, to really apply the spiritual disciplines into our lives, but I want to encourage you that the spiritual disciplines are for your good. Let's just name some. What are some of the spiritual disciplines? What are some of the things that spiritually you have to be disciplined to do? Prayer. Prayer is definitely one that requires discipline. I heard fasting from Uncle Manu. It, it, I, I've never met a, a lot of people that just tend to fast to fast, but um, when it comes to the spiritual discipline of fasting, it, it, it takes priority. Come on, what else? What are some other spirit? Being in the word, right? To discipline yourself to reading the word or memorizing the word, right? Creates discipline for us to do those type of things. You know, Paul writes to his young disciple, Paul, the apostle Paul was traveling. He was raising up the next wave of pastors and ministry leaders. And he got connected to a young teenager named Timothy, which I would say, hey, you're never, you're never too young to start going and growing in your walk. In fact, little... Christopher Jr. just got baptized in this previous service. He shared powerfully how the Lord is at work in his life. A middle school student, right? And so uh, spiritual disciplines, we see Paul write to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, these verses. Now, this first verse is interesting. Let me just read it. But stay away from worthless stories that are typical of old women. <laughs> no shade to the older women in the house, all right? Um, shout out to all the grandmas, all right? My bad. <laughs> Take your beef up with Paul. Basically, he was saying some of the older ladies would tell stories and they just had too much details, like, get to the point already, mama, right? Um, and he says, make the stories, uh, make the stories, get to the valuable stuff, leave out the worthless stuff. Um, he says, rather, don't write me an email on this, please. Rather, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. That's the purpose of the text that he's wanting to get at. He's saying, he's saying, discipline, there's the, there's the word, Discipline your body, discipline yourself, discipline your life. Why? For the purpose of godliness. For bodily training, right, he says, is, is just slightly beneficial. Which I'm, I like because he's saying, uh, you know, working on your body is beneficial. Making sure that you're eating right and work, making sure you're, you're training and doing your workouts. Hey, no shade to that. He says it's slightly beneficial. But godliness is beneficial for all things. Since it holds promise for the present life, and also for the life to come. So he's saying, apply that same training regimen, right? That, 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 that same training discipline that you would maybe put into action that you might become more healthier. Apply that same discipline to your walk with the Lord because that has value for all of life, right? Not just in this life, but in the eternal life to come. Spiritual disciplines are key. We should uh, we, should, we should discipline ourselves for the, for the purpose of godliness. Or another translation says, train yourself for the purpose of godliness. What that's going to do in silence and solitude, it's going to make your time with the Lord richer. Yeah. I was thinking about this, that let's just say you had 15 minutes. 
All right? You had 15 minutes in your day, maybe starting tomorrow, that you wanted to try to live out this sermon. I'll give you my Pastor Hyden challenge, all right? A 15-minute workout, okay, of silence and solitude. You take the first five minutes and pray. And can I just tell you, five minutes of prayer, you can accomplish a lot. Like sometimes I've like prayed for three minutes and I'm like, all right, I kind of ran out of stuff. But I had two more minutes and I'm thinking in this five minute block and no, wait, I guess I didn't really pray for my neighbors. I don't even know some of their names. Let me start praying for my neighbors. Well, let me actually start praying for my church family. Let me pray for the worship team. Let me pray for my city. Let me pray for my nuclear family. No, you know what? Actually, let me pray for my city. Let me pray for the sports teams in the city. Let me pray for the church plants in the city. Let me pray for the nation. Let me pray for the nations. Let me pray for the missionaries we parted with. All of a sudden, that five minutes got very robust, right? And I'm like, wow, that prayer time just increased in the silence and solitude, and I needed it. But wait, I got more in my 15-minute block. Let me do five minutes in the Word, right? And then I open up the book. Maybe it's the proverb of the day, or maybe you start in one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or maybe you, you do one of the wisdom books in the Bible, or you just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go back to Genesis and just start right from the beginning, or Hey, how about one of Paul's letters to the churches? And you just spend five minutes in the word. And maybe that just looks like one chapter, but that one chapter was the one chapter you needed for the day. And then let's just say, hey, maybe you, you grabbed a journal. I grabbed a few of these walk church journals and you open up this journal and you say, okay, I'm gonna take five minutes and here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write down in this journal all the things that God just showed me in the last 10 minutes. Because he showed you something in prayer. He showed you someone to pray for. And then he showed you a few different nuggets in the word that you didn't have before you read it. And then you did a 15-minute workout with the word in, in silence and solitude, no phone, no music, just you and him. Can I just tell you, if you do that, it'll take you deeper. Come on. Hey, can I just give somebody a journal that's open to trying it? You got to catch it. Oh, watch your head. Come on. What about this side? Anybody over here? Oh, coming in hot. Look, I want to encourage you to try it, right? And we got some more over at the merch store if you want to grab some after. But I just want to encourage you. Hey, 15 minutes would change your life. Would give you a word, some intentional time with God in prayer. You might write something down that you might want to revisit. In fact, you might have something to share with somebody who needs it right? Hey, this is what God spoke to me today. I was, I was applying silence and solitude. And watch how God moves. I read this quote that uh, convicted me recently. It comes from uh, a pastor named John Piper. And Piper says, one of the greatest uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from lack of time. One of the greatest uses of that little screen time app that will hit you and convict you and call you out is that the reason why you weren't spending time with God was not due to a lack of time. It was not because you were just too busy. I don't know when I can get it in or fit it in because your phone will expose that. Come on. And, 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 and prove to you, actually, you, you, you actually did have 15 minutes. Do you know what the problem was? It wasn't that you had a lack of time. You just had a lack of discipline. And so silence and solitude, you know what it'll do? Silence and solitude will help create the discipline. So instead of just sitting there like, wow, this is 15 minutes of just sitting here, talk to God. <laughs> Write something down. Open the word. And, and, and taste and see, come on, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, there's a book called The Spiritual Disciplines. It's written by a, a professor named Donald Whitney. And I remember reading this book and it just, it really helped me see the disciplines in a fresh way. Donald Whitney says it like this as he writes on the topic of silence and solitude. He says, the time for silence and solitude will rarely be easy to chisel out of your schedule. Putting that right up front. The world, the flesh, and the enemy of your soul will see to that. But if you discipline yourself to do it, your only regret will be that you didn't start sooner. I love that idea. What's Whitney saying? 
He's saying, hey, your time with the Lord in silence and solitude, you'll actually realize it was good. It'll be better. Now, every, every time doesn't have to be a home run necessarily where you're like, man, the Lord spoke to me. My life's forever changed. Sometimes you just got to get on base. You know, hey, I got, I got in with the Lord today. It was solid. I, I felt like I, I shared a lot. I prayed. I wrote some good stuff down. And some days it's going to be that 15 minute might, might turn into a whole hour because the Lord is moving so powerfully in that time. I would encourage you to schedule it. You might have to put it on your calendar. Time with the Lord. 15 minutes. You might have to tell somebody, hey, you know what? I got a meeting. I'm sorry. I got to go. Who are you meeting with? I'm meeting with the Lord. I can't overschedule that again. I got, a, I got an appointment with God who's always with me, but there's something about being still. There's something about silence and solitude that I'm able to hear him better, that I'm able to accomplish without my phone, without the noise, without the distraction. I'm able to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm able to, um, to make it better. Let me give you the second point. Spiritual disciplines will help you grow in being ready for the battle. It'll help you recharge for the battle. Here's the truth. Look, look at me, church. We're all in a spiritual battle. Every single one of us are living it. Does, does anybody else just feel like you're in a battle? Okay, good. I'm glad that I'm not alone. Well, the truth is that you are, right? The, the, the Christian life's not a playground. It's a battleground. The devil hates what God is doing here. I'll tell you what, if you commit to 21 days of prayer and fasting, okay, you're on the enemy's radar. You're a threat to the darkness. You're making moves in the spirit that's going to change things in your own life and in those around you. And so silence and solitude, what does that do? Man, that helps you recharge. Let me give you a convicting verse that I'm going to just put it out there, conviction alert. We see it in the life of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. What just happened? Well, Jesus just got baptized. He's getting ready to start his public messianic ministry. Before he does that, it says Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Come on. Then Jesus, right after he got baptized, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit, capital S, into the wilderness to be tempted by the... Dang! We tell people, hey, if you get baptized, be ready for the war. You, you, you're marking yourself as somebody who's saying, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a child of God. Buried in sin, risen to walk in the new life, right? And so what does silence and solitude do? It recharges you for the battle. What is it about the Holy Spirit? Come on, let me show you Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. In Luke chapter 4, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Spirit of God, amen? Full of the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit tells him, leads him into the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Come on, anybody appreciate the humanity of King Jesus as well, right? Like a 40-day fast? Uh, yeah, right? Jesus was, was hungry. But during those 40 days, the Holy Spirit led him to silence and solitude. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Some of your greatest times with the Father will be in the times of the wilderness. Sometimes we feel like we're in a wilderness season and we're like, where's God at? Are you taking time in the wilderness season to connect with him? Or are you just complaining? The Holy Spirit led Jesus into silence and solitude. So if that's happening in his life, how much more will it happen in ours? I think the Holy Spirit does some of his best work in silence and solitude. Because it's there that he has our full attention. I would even call you out to say you're not smart enough or discerning enough to know what to do at all times. You need help from above. And there's times where you just get alone with God and you say, Lord, I think this is right. Is it? Holy Spirit, am I, is there something you want me to remember? Is there something you want me to say? Is there something you want me to do? Remember, this is what Jesus modeled 
And he did it for a reason. I'll put that up as a reality statement because I don't want you to miss it. A silence and solitude was the pattern and practice of Jesus' life and ministry. So as he's doing his battle with, with Satan and, and darkness and, and, and shaking up the world, right? Silence and solitude was his pattern. I'm not convinced it's a pattern in our lives, including my own. Like maybe there's one-off moments where, yeah, let's create just mo- time of silence and solitude. But I like to have some noise. I like to, in fact, shout out to my amazing wife who called me out yesterday uh, in, yeah, Nina, do it. Call him out. Um, well, we were driving. Now y'all know we got four little boys and they're very active. But in this moment, while we're driving as a family and their games are, there's, uh, there's noise being played in the car and there was music on, we're connecting the Bluetooth and stuff's being played. And um, there was a quick like 10, 15 seconds where like everything must have just stopped and ended in the, the, the power button on the, the sound just got clicked off and it was just silence. And suddenly I noticed I was very quick to be like, what, what just happened? Turn this thing back on. What just happened? Turn this back up, right? And Nina just said to me, Aren't, can't you just for like 10, 15 seconds just be content without noise? And I was like, man, you must know my sermon coming up because uh, maybe I'm realizing I'm, I'm a, there's some addiction tendencies to, to activity, right? And, I, and, and, and without subconsciously noticing... The pattern and practice of Jesus was to withdraw to desolate places for the purpose of silence and solitude. Let me give you the third and final point. We'll we'll close here. And I think this last point may be the best point. To go deeper in silence and solitude will help you hear his voice. We do silence and solitude. Number one... It's going to help you grow in the spiritual disciplines. It's going to actually help you pray the prayer point. It's going to actually help you open your Bible. You're already locked in. Number two, it's going to help you recharge for the battle. Jesus went into silence and solitude and was covered in spiritual warfare. Number three, it's going to help you hear his voice. Let me just share this with you, and I, I, feel, um, I feel convicted about this reality, but I just, want you to, I just want you to indulge me for a second that, that this could be true. I think one of the reasons why we don't do silence and solitude, or perhaps why we're scared of silence and solitude, is because we might just hear his voice. It's because there's something in us that thinks, if I really do this, if I really shut the door and leave the phone out and spend time with God, he might actually spend time with me. And I think that you're right. But can I just tell you to not be scared of him spending time with you? In fact, the best voice you need to hear is his It's always been his. I just want to imagine you taking time to get with the Lord in silence and solitude. And let's just say you are there and you're in that moment and you're spending your 15 minutes or maybe it's longer or maybe it's shorter. It's less about the time. It's more about if you're doing it. And all of a sudden you sense the Holy Spirit fill the room and you're listening and you sense the Holy Spirit himself say, I love you so much. Wouldn't that change your day? If you felt like the presence of God invade that space and say, hey, I am so proud of you. I've been waiting to tell you that all day. And silence and solitude, right, creates those moments for the Lord himself to show up in your life and through his soft, still whisper, speak a word of life to you. Speak a word of truth to you, right? It's less about the noise and the distraction and the chaos, and it's the voice of God that comes in and literally silences and changes everything. You can, you can walk with a little pep in your step after that. What happened to you? Yeah. 
the, the, the Lord spoke to me, just reminded me I'm called. He's for me. He, he's equipped me. I have everything I need to be everything he's called me to be. And I just needed to get alone with God to, be, to remember that. Come on, amen? And he even gave me some new ideas. He showed me some new things. I read this quote from a, a pastor named John Mark Comer. I actually read this book last year. Um, it's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And this book really convicted me because we live in this hurry day and age. And, and Comer, he, he writes in the book that you know, silence and solitude, the, the end is, isn't silence and solitude as itself. It's, it's to come back to God. It's to come back to our true selves, right? The, the goal to, to eliminate hurry is because it'll create more moments to come back to him. Um, got a few of these books. I'll, I'll give a few out after church. We also will sell them in the merch area. If you really are serious about this, there's a great chapter on slowing where he writes on silence and solitude and just gives some practices. I love what the, um, I love what the Puritans of the old age used to say this phrase, make it better. Come on, everybody say, make it better. Make it better. Make it better. Every day, our days are filled with moments to make it better. For example, stoplight. Does anybody ever get to a stoplight and you get to the stoplight and you're just so quick to just unlock and then you beep. Ah! <laughs> Somebody said never. Shout out to you. <laughs> respect, respect. But there's other people that are tempted at times. Can I just tell you, you can make the stoplight better by saying, okay, okay, stoplight. Here's my moment. Click off the music, turn off the podcast. Let me even turn off the sermon. I'm just going to make it better by just, I'm going to give this stoplight to the Lord. I'm going to talk to him. You might be, uh, you might be in the grocery store and you might realize, you know what? I'm not going to go to the shortest line. I'm going to go to the longest line. And I'm going to make it better. I'm not going to read the gossip magazine. I'm not going to fall for the candy trap. I'm going to use this long line to just wait and talk to God. I'm going to talk to him about all the things going on in my life. I'm going to be aware and be present in the moment. While I'm here, I'm not just going to be in the moment. I'm going to make it better. Right? You might be doing some laundry or doing some dishes. Make it better. While I do this, I'm not just going to watch the news in the background. I'm going to make it better. I'm going to, I'm going to ask the Lord. I'm going to give this, this, these moments to the Lord. Amen. I want to hear his voice. I want to hear the voice of God in, in my life internally and, and often. Silence and solitude is, is, is one of the ways. Come on. One of the ways that will help you do that. I just want to help you go deeper. And this is a way to do it. I close with a quote from uh, the great Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon. Um, Spurgeon says it like this. There are times when solitude is better than society. I love that right there. And silence is wiser than speech. We should be better Christians if we were more alone, waiting upon God and gathering through meditation on his word, spiritual strength for labor in his service. There's something about silence and solitude when we actually do it, that we actually get stronger for the, the service he's called us to do. So I, I, I'm asking you, I'm calling you up to find the time. Now you might say, hey, the only way I could actually do this, honestly, Pastor Hyden, if I beat everybody before they got awake. And that's so hard. And can I just tell you, I know. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Look at Jesus in action. Rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. That's my least favorite part. While it was still dark. <laughs> he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. Look, Jesus is the standard. He's the model. This was his pattern. 
if you ever read Mark chapter one, the whole chapter, you'll realize this day that he gave to prayer at the beginning time, he did so much in this one day. It would be a lifetime of ministry for us, what Jesus did in the day. But he knew in order for me to be effective in all the things I'm gonna do, I gotta start and charge up in silence, in solitude with the Father. It's not enough to just say, okay, I'm gonna wake up at this time and I'm gonna lay in my bed and I'm gonna pray. Jesus knew that's a good way to go back to sleep, come on. He said, I gotta get up and I gotta get out. I gotta depart to get this time in with him. And I believe you'll be glad you did, amen? Hey, would you pray with me? Let's lift it up. Father, we just say, we received this word today. And God, we need your word today. So Father, help us to apply your word now in our daily lives for your glory, your presence, Lord. God, we need a fresh wind. God, would you, would you blow on our silence and solitude? Will we not be afraid to hear your voice? Would we be eager to hear your voice more than any other voice? That your word would be the apple of our eye. It would be the, the drink for our thirst. It would be the bread for our hunger, God. It would be you, you. Your, your presence is fullness of joy. So God, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you as Savior, Right now, I want to just invite you right now to call on the name of the Lord. Just call his name. Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I know I'm a sinner. I believe you are my Savior. Help me. Save me. Heal me. Change me. I'm ready to walk with you. God, I pray you would deepen our silence and solitude. Deepen our time with you, God. God, as you draw people near, as you save people's lives, as you call people to repentance, as you call people to recommit, may we always see there's more joy in you than in anything else. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen.